everybody and welcome. I am Atomic Zero, Addicted to Loot, and today we're going to be continuing my factions video with The Empire. This video is a little bit more delayed than what I would want it to be, but it has allowed me to add some details from the latest video released by Creative Assembly, specifically the Empire vs. Chaos Warriors video. And just like with the Dwarf video, we're going to be structuring this with lore, the unique gameplay mechanic for The Empire, how they handle diplomacy, technology, what types of settlements they can occupy, and then we'll close it out with their army composition and their army strategy. The Empire is a faction that has been influenced by many ancient empires of Warhammer, including the Dwarves and the High Elves. Loosely based on the Renaissance period of the Holy Roman Empire, the Empire is a confederation of feudal states and is constantly in a state of political turmoil. If you watched my Dwarf faction video, it may come as no surprise that most of what is known of the early history of the Empire comes from the Dwarves. Prior to the formation of the Empire, the human civilization was c composed of many tribes and please excuse my pronunciation. Some of the tribes were the Umbergans, the Teotogans, the Thuringians, Chuseans, the Norsi, and the Murrigans. These primitive men lived in mud huts and used crude weapons. During the Great Orc and Dwarven War, the dwarves saw the humans as potential allies and the humans looked to the dwarves to learn metalsmithing and weaponsmithing. Thus an alliance was struck to combat the Greenskin Horde that was breaking through the World's Edge Mountains. The greatest of the human warriors was Sigmar himself, whose birth was foretold by a twin-tailed comet. He was the first son of the Umburigan chieftain and quickly grew to be a great warrior and commander. Sigmar forged the alliance between the humans and the dwarves when he rescued High King Kurgan from a band of orcs that had kidnapped him and his family when they were traveling to the Grey Mountains. As fate would have it, Sigmar was tracking this band of orcs when the kidnapping occurred. Sigmar was rewarded with a magical heirloom of Kurgan's, Karl Muraz, a rune-forged warhammer that means skull splitter in the dwarven tongue. Upon the death of his father, Sigmar became the ruler of the Imburogans and sought out to unite the human tribes. After many years of conquest and diplomacy, Sigmar had united 12 human tribes under him and behind his vision of a land free of orcs and goblins, governed by fair laws. Driving the orcs and the remaining human tribes that opposed his rule south past the Grey Mountains or north beyond the Middle Mountains, Sigmar was less as the undisputed ruler between the World's Edge Mountains and the Great Ocean. Alas, the return of the Greenskins to the Dwarven lands forced Sigmar to return to war alongside Kurgan. The war between the dwarves and the orcs culminated at the Battle of Blackfire Pass. Sigmar gathered his armies and joined the dwarves to stand against a wog that would threaten both of their kingdoms past the Black Mountains. Like the Battle of Thermopylae, the Alliance fought at the narrowest section of the pass, taking away the greenskin advantage of numbers. After many hours, the countless green waves crashing against their shields finally ceased, and the remaining orcs were killed and burned. The battle finally ended when the Dwarven and Empire soldiers launched a counterattack, scattering the remaining greenskin ranks. Following the battle, Sigmar was crowned the Empire of all the lands his people inhabited, and ruled from the capital of Reichdorf, later to be renamed Altdorf. Sigmar ruled for another 50 years until he stepped away from the throne and disappeared after a journey east to Karazakarak. The void left by Sigmar gave rise to the Elector Counts as they decided to hold true to Sigmar's vision and to vote one of them into the throne. The Elector Counts were able to keep peace within the Empire and voted many emperors into the throne. However, over the centuries, the Empire has suffered many invasions, rampant plagues, civil wars, and attacks from numerous monstrous enemies the first of which were the Skaven Wars that began with the Black Plague that the Skaven unleashed onto the Empire. This killed thousands of citizens, including the hated Emperor Boris Goldgatherer, whose incompetence as a ruler provided an opening for the Skaven to attack. Luckily, Count Mandred led the remaining army to victory against the Skaven. However, a Skaven assassin took their revenge on the newly elected Emperor with a poison blade. With his death, the Empire's recovery was halted. The void left by Emperor Mandred led to civil unrest that tore the Empire apart and caused the Elector Counts to battle one another in civil war. At times, the Empire had multiple Emperors who all thought they deserved the throne. The Empire was brought to its knees when the mighty Orc war boss, Gorbad Ironclaw, destroyed the city of Salad and butchered Count Eldred, stealing his crown in Runefang, one of the twelve magical blades gifted to the leaders of the original human tribes by the Dwarven High King. Ironclaw's invasion was broken at the Siege of Altdorf, but Eldred's Runefang was, wasn't recovered and wouldn't be found for centuries. The Vampire Wars quickly followed and nearly collapsed the Empire, only to be halted at the gates of Altdorf, seems to be a pattern here, when the Grand Theologist Wilhelm had Vlad von Karstein's magical ring stolen. 
Wilhelm sacrificed himself to slay the Vampire Emperor by throwing both of them off the battlement of Altdorf. If you want to know more about the Vampire Wars, please stay tuned for my Vampire Counts of Action video. However, the worst threat to the Empire was the Great Chaos War led by the powerful Chaos Champion, Osvar Kull. Kull led his army through the Troll Empire and into Kislev. His army filled with demons, sorcerers, beastmen, and Chaos Knights seized the Kislev city of Prague, and the city fell after many months of battle. The Empire needed a hero to lead the counterattack against the Swarm of Chaos, and they found it in the form of Magnus the Pious, a nobleman of Nolan. Magnus gathered an army so massive that it had to break into two since no single area could provide enough supplies for their numbers. Magnus met the Chaos Army as it was laying siege to the city as Kislev. The city was barely hanging on behind the Dwarven and Kislevites defending the city. Magnus launched an immediate attack against the Chaos Horde. He had success at first behind his artillery and knights, but Cole mounted a counterattack that nearly defeated Magnus and the city of Kislev. The second army of Magnus, composed of lancers and imperial knights, arrived at the battle and drove a wedge into the Chaos Horde that delivered the finishing blow. Magnus was elected emperor by the people of the Empire. He proved to be a competent leader and strived to restore the Empire. It is at this time that Karl Franz started to make his presence known, and this is where Total War Warhammer will resume if you play as the Empire. Now that we made it through the lore, it's time to get to some of the more exciting things, specifically the unique gameplay mechanics of the Empire, which is their diplomacy and their technology. Politics plays a large role within the Empire, and the Elector Counts are the rulers of all the individual providences that make up the Empire lands. And as you play as the Empire, you'll have to deal with each one of them if you want to expand your kingdom or unite the Empire underneath you. Creative Assembly has already stated that the diplomacy will be a large mechanic of the Empire, and you'll either need to use tricky diplomacy or politics to expand your rule, or just go to straight off war with each one of them to expand your lands as the Empire. Researching technology within the Empire will be very unique compared to the other factions. Certain buildings will need to be completed before specific technologies can be researched. I would think this would tie into the various colleges contained within the Empire, such as the School of Magic and the Gunnery School. At this time, we haven't seen any hints as to how the Empire technology tree will branch out, but I have a feeling it will be somewhat similar to the Dwarves, which is an economic tree as well as a technology tree. Now time to get into the type of settlements the Empire can occupy, as well as their locations within the campaign map. Besides their own settlements, the Empire can occupy Vampire Count territories. These settlements will be mostly confined in the northwest part of the campaign map as highlighted on the screen. With the Chaos Waste above you and the Badlands below you, your Empire will bubble out into a massive circle as you expand. The Empire cities are bustling city centers, bursting with sprawling houses, churches, and markets. Here's an example of one of the building designs, and we'll highlight more of this in a clip from the Vampire Count Siege video of Altdorf. And this is Altdorf as seen in the Vampire Count Siege video. As you can see, it's very stone-walled, very kind of medieval-esque, something like you would almost see in like Medieval 2 Total War. It has the twin-tailed comet of Sigmar scattered everywhere, a lot of regal statues, big squares, and it's very much filled with all different types of homes, churches, markets. I mean, the design of each individual building doesn't seem like it's repetitive at all, which is great. You have the red and white empire colors scattered everywhere, and I'm assuming this is be a similar site when a vampire count settlement is taken over, that it will kind of go nice and white, that it will be nice and polished. And now to close out it's just a very Empire massive, sprawling economy or we'll a very sma army sprawling metropolitan area. We'll get more into how they fight on the battlefield. This roster is taken straight off of the website of the Total War Wiki page. They have five melee infantry, two missile infantry, one cav unit, three missile cav unit, two vehicles, four artillery, no monstrous infantry, and two monstrous cav infantry. The only flying infantry they have, or the flying units they have, are the mounts for their lords and their heroes. Combining all the videos I can find, I actually have unit cards of all the infantry minus one, and the only other one I'm missing would be plain spearman units. That means non-shielded. So let's walk through. First up, we have the great swords. They're about the highest tier infantry of the empire. 
They're armored, they have armor piercing, and they're anti-infantry. As you can see, they have the highest armor out of all the other units. Leadership's really high, speed is pretty comparable, good melee attack, good melee defense, and their weapon strength is pretty high comparatively to the others with a good charge bonus. The swordsmen and the spearmen kind of make up your tier 1 standard fodder units. I'd say the swordsmen more than the spearmen. The spearmen actually have the specification of anti-large, meaning good against giants or the giant spiders, trolls, what have you. And they actually have good charge defense against larger foes and or heavy cab, which is pretty nice. The halberdiers also, once again, definitely a far better anti-cav unit. And once they're probably of the higher tier than the swordsman and the spearman unit. The halberdiers really make up a lot of the empire infantry and especially defensive units and siege battle defenses. Halberdiers will be used quite a bit. Armor, once again, is pretty comparable to the other two. Pretty good leadership, same speed, melee attack, not so much, but their melee defense is going to be high and their weapon strength is going to be high. Charge bonus with the Spearmen and the Halberdiers won't be too high because they're a little bit more of a stationary defensive unit. Uh, the Great Swords and the regular swords are more of your offensive infantry. Okay, so the Missile Infantry. Luckily, well, there's only two of them. So I was able to get both of their unit cards and they're the Crossbowmen and the Handgunners. I'm a little surprised the Crossbowmen aren't armor piercing as well as the Handgunners, but I guess the additional range is what really makes them useful. And as you could guess, the handgunners are really good for taking down heavier tier infantry with far more armor, as well as larger units like giants. Now if we look down, I mean, they're, the, the majority of their base stats are about the same. If you go down to their ammunition, range, and missile damage, of course the crossbowmen are going to have a little bit more ammo, definitely more range. I'm surprised their missile damage is higher than the handgunners, but I'm assuming the armor piercing probably outweighs that a little bit. It also could be that their <laughs> the unit card I have is a triple gold chevron unit versus a single silver chevron unit. So that probably is boosting up their damage quite a bit. Besides the two demigriff cav units, the Empire only has one normal cav unit, which is the Reichsguard, and they're a really heavy shock cav. So they're very heavily armored and they're really good at anti-infantry, meaning using them in hammer and anvil and or flank charges or even a straight out charge on a tier one unit that's not being supported. They'll cause some massive damage and probably destroy a fair amount of that squad. So if you look, their charge bonus is pretty high and the rest of their stats are pretty comparable. But if you look at their armor, much higher than any other type of cav unit. So they will be a far more grindy, far more durable cav unit. Now, they do have three missile cav units, which do balance this out. They have the Outlanders, the Pistoliers, and the Outlanders have another variant, which is a <laughs> grenade launcher out of all things. So we didn't get to see them yet, but I'm assuming they'll be a lot of fun. So the Outlanders are armor piercing as well as a Vanguard deployment. Actually, both of them are Vanguard deployment. And the Vanguard deployment, if you didn't watch the Vampire Count, story mission video released by Total War or Creative Assembly. Vanguard units actually get to deploy outside the normal deployment range. So if you kind of know where your enemy is going to be deploying, you can instantly deploy these guys on the flank. You can deploy them right in front of them. So they offer some additional flexibility when it comes to positioning on the battlefield. Pistoliers are far faster since they are only single-handed weapons versus the Outlanders, which are a two-handed weapon which is why they have armor piercing as opposed to just very fast. If you look at their regular stats, Outlanders have higher leadership, little less speed, and slightly better base stats. Charge bonus is about the same, but ammunition is a little higher, range is definitely higher, and their missile damage is far higher with the armor, pierc armor piercing. The Empire has two vehicles, one of which we have is the Luminar of Heesh and the all glorious steam tank. I'm assuming the steam tank will have pretty good stats and will probably be very expensive, one of the higher tier units of the Empire. But the Luminarch of Heesh is definitely a kind of like a single target high damage artillery unit. It's not going to be used to drive a lot of AoE damage like a mortar or the Hellstorm battery. It's really good at taking down far larger units like sniping out a giant. Uh, 
So their base stats are going to be kind of deplorable, but if you look at their range and the damage, I mean, over a thousand missile damage is quite insane, and their range is really long as well. It's, if these get caught into any type of melee combat or they get flanked by any type of cav, they're going down real quick or they're going to break really quick, as opposed to the steam tank, which has both a cannon on it for artillery as well as a big charging bonus. Um, the steam tank actually can hold its own in melee combat. It'll be really interesting to see what the unit card for the steam tank will be. We're also lucky enough to have all four infantry cards of the artillery pieces for the Empire. And they are the mortar, the great cannon, the hellstorm rocket battery, and the hell blaster volley gun. The mortar and your great cannon will be used on siege attacks and siege defenses. You know, either attacking the wall, shooting over the wall. Even the hellstorm rocket battery can be used to shoot over the wall. It's interesting that the mortar and the hellstorm are both marked as anti-infantry. The Great Cannon has anti-large capability as well as armor-piercing missiles and the Hell Blaster Volley Gun is armor-piercing as well. Your Mortar, Great Cannon, the Hell Storm all will be more AOE damage while the Hell Blaster will be more individualized, located, more centrally located damage. So there are going to be a lot of little damaging missiles as opposed to the Great Cannon, the Mortar, and the Hell Storm which are far larger missile units which have much far greater impact if you look down below, the range of the Great Cannon and the Hellstorm, both are pretty high. Hellstorm is poor accuracy, probably because it's shooting off, I think it's somewhere around the lo somewhere around like nine missiles at a time. The Great Cannon definitely will probably have far better accuracy, considering I think there's only like three to a unit, uh, four to a unit, sorry. And if you look at the rest, I mean, all their base stats are going to be about the same. I'm surprised the Mortar has... A little lower range than the Great Cannon and the Hellstorm, considering the large arc I thought would give it a far greater range. Missile damage, pretty high for all of them, but the Hell Blaster looks like it squeaks out the most. Moving on to the crowd favorite, the Demigriff Knights, which are the very heavy shock cab of the Empire, and it also comes with a Lance variant, which should, I guess, be similar to the Bard variant of the Vampire Counts. So they're very heavily armored, they have armor piercing and they're anti-infantry, well they're freaking giant griffins that knights are, heavy armored knights are riding on top of, so I, I would assume they would be anti-infantry. And if you could even imagine the charge bonus with the lance version is even higher. So, I mean a higher 130 armor, pretty high leadership, and actually they're considered a slow cab unit which is surprising at their 80 speed. But these are very great shock infantry, very great at flanking, very great at hammer anvil. I mean, they're definitely much higher than the Reichsguard, and they're going to be a much higher tier cav unit, but the Reichsguard will probably make up the early stages of cav for the Empire. But these guys are just fun to watch. They're an amazing unit type, and their animations are insane. They can really send any type of single tier or low tier unit just crumbling and flying over the battlefield, which we saw in the uh, Chaos Warrior Let's Play. The last set of unit cards we'll go over are for heroes and lords, at least the ones I can find. You have the Light Wizard, the Celestial Lizard, Balthazar Gelt, and Karl Franz. The Light Wizard, who would have thought, is the lore of light. The Celestial Lizard is the lore of heavens. Balthazar Gelt is the lore of metal. And Karl Franz is another one of the legendary lords that you can choose from. He is purely melee, and in this stance, he was riding his trusty Griffin Deathclaw, which is why he is listed as flying. I'm assuming as well as cause terror, and I don't know if the armor piercing is based as a base stat for him or if it's an upgraded stat. So if we look down here, the weapon strength for all of them are really high, which you'd consider for a hero ca um, character. But all the, I guess for the Light Wizard, Celestial Wizard, and Balthazar Gelt, their main power is going to be coming from their spell book. The Light Wizard's primarily for buffs and debuffs. Celestial Wizard does have some pretty high damaging capability considering we did see the Meteor cast he has within the Blackfire Pass video and the Chaos Warrior um, video. Bathazar Gelt has a lot of interesting things, both debuffs, buffs, as and uh, damaging spells. We saw in the Vampire Count Siege Battle of Altdorf that a spell from uh, Balthazar Gout basically even took out a siege tower almost single-handedly. So some pretty powerful stuff. Karl Franz, just kind of like Manfred, is an extremely capable melee fighter. He's going to be used to just 
rush into the ranks, and he's like a type of general or lord that you're going to want to have right directly in the thick of things. Uh, I'm assuming almost all of his abilities will be melee based, especially when he gets his Deathclaw flying mount. He is pretty insane. Uh, basically, all of his attacks go into even larger AoE and get even far stronger. The fact that he has 100 armor even means that he can withstand far more than probably any one of the other types of weathered and he actually can stay in combat up far longer because his leadership is pretty high and he won't route like the other squishy wizards in these hero cards. And to close things out, we'll talk about the army strategy for the Empire. The Empire is a very adaptive army and can be composed to fight in many different types of ways. They can be a single infantry line with a lot of artillery and missile, meaning a very defensive army. They can be a, be a very aggressive army with a lot of fodder units and high tier units on the flank with a lot of heavy shock cav to do hand and anvil and flank even their vehicles can be used to be a center point of the army it's, it's a very interesting type of army composition as opposed to something like the dwarves or the vampire counts or even the greenskins you you know either play very defensive or very offensive you could really tailor make an empire army to be almost anything you want they can be very good at holding defensive sieges with their halberders and their artillery. They can be very good at offensive sieges with their great swords and their armor piercing. They have anti-big units. They have anti-cav units. So they're kind of the Swiss army knife of army compositions for all these factions. And I, for some odd reason, have a personal aversion to human characters and factions within any type of fantasy game because for some odd reason, I feel far more inclined to play some kind of monstrous faction you now dwarves vampire counts what have you but the empire has a lot of upside to it when it comes to an army comp or to battle i mean you could use a pretty standy standard army and encounter almost any one of the other three factions and still be pretty capable of combating them where their strengths lie or you can just completely make very one-sided armies so it's very exciting i mean you have the monstrous cab units of the demigriffs you have two of the more exciting vehicles in the game with the luminarch of heesh and the steam tank and their artillery is also really fun to watch and you can actually go first person into them too so it's a very cinematic very adaptive army that i think just about anyone would have a fun time with I think if they could get behind the diplomacy and the technology of the Empire, it'd be a very good army for beginners or even someone that's just trying to get a good taste of what Total War Warhammer will have to offer, considering they have just about everything minus some flying, but even you can even get some flying by the Pegasus for the casters or for Deathclaw for Karl Franz or even other Griffin units for your heroes. The Empire has six possible hero characters, one lord character, and then they have two legendary lord characters just like all the other factions. The six heroes that they can choose from are the Captain of the Empire, which is a melee hero, Warrior Priest, which is a melee caster hero, a Witch Hunter, which is purely ranged, and they actually, I don't know if it's called a caster, they're only labeled as ranged, but in the Vampire Count Siege of Altdorf, uh, the Witch Hunter was said to be casting judgment, or at least activating judgment on a few units so it's maybe it's a type of damaging spell maybe but not considered a caster but their range dps is off the charts and then for their caster units they have a celestial wizard a light wizard and a bright wizard they are the lore of heavens light and fire respectively uh, the celestial wizard will be a bit of buffing as well as a bit of high damage the light wizard is purely buffing and debuffing and then the bright wizard it's going to be where all your damage comes from. They're going to be a very fun thing to watch on the battlefield. The Lord for the Empire, meaning the general that can lead your armies, minus your legendary lords, is just called the General of the Empire. He's purely a melee unit, so probably an upgrade to the Captain of the Empire. Okay, so for the legendary lords of the Empire, you have Karl Franz and Balthazar Gelt. Karl Franz is a Prince of Altdorf and Electoral Count of Reichland. His empire-wide trait, if you choose him, it's easier and cheaper to recruit for and build massive armies. They don't really go into much more detail than that. I don't know if that means that overall unit cost and upkeep cost is much less for, Balthus or for Karl Franz, but 
that will be a uh, no remain to be seen. Balthazar Gelt is a mage uh, in the lo of the lore of metal. Gelt's natural affinity for magic study improves both the cost of building centers of mystic learning and recruiting their mages for his forces, leading to a strong emphasis on magic and supremacy on the battlefield. So, for the three herald types of Celestial Wizard, Light Wizard, and Bright Wizard, they're going to be far more capable of being in an army under Balthazar Gelt, as well as building your centers of magic or your halls of magic will be far cheaper. So it really depends. I feel like Karl Franz will be far better if you want to focus on infantry units, missile units, cav, basically everything that's not a caster. And then Balthazar Gout will be purely range-based with a lot of casters. And I can see either one being a very entertaining play style. We'll quickly step through the highlighted spells and abilities of each one. So Karl Franz, he gets a unique mount called Deathclaw, which is a insanely large griffin who just looks awesome on the battlefield we can see him in the empire versus the chaos warriors let's play deadly onslaught he becomes a whirlwind of martial fury gaining increased charge resistance charge bonus melee attack and reduced fatigue stand your ground it's a buff to all units in a certain area of effect around karl franz Irres irrepressible if i can speak right the Empire's tenacity and drive means he requires a much less recovery time after being wounded. So if he gets killed in a battle, he returns to the front lines far more quickly than the other legendary lords. Leader of men, he's inspiring presence to all who fight with him. Karl Franz's general aura is substantially larger, so that's pretty nice. So the moral buff that his generals have will be far larger. A heroic leader and impairing battle speech raises the morale of target units anywhere on the battlefield. So... A lot of buffing as well as a lot of physical abilities in combat, which is what to be expected from a melee hero such as Empire Emperor Karl Franz. Moving on to Balthazar Gelt, Evasion. He has increased speed and acceleration on the battlefield. Arcane Conduit, Balthazar, commitment to the arcane arts has made him a magical conduit, increasing the strength of his winds of magic wherever he is. So he has... Basically a larger MP pool, which is nice for a caster. The Staff of the Lens embarks on a unique quest to secure the magical staff fashioned for the very first Supreme Patriarch. Plague of Rust is a debuff lowering resistance of his enemy. Mighty Forge is a buff that increases the armor of his any type of friendly unit. And Earthing, years of training and a properly stand significant reduces the chance of Balthazar's spells being miscasted. So if he gets attacked while dur uh, during casting a spell, it's far less likely to be interrupted. And that will do it for my Empire Faction Overview video. Thank you for watching and thank you for joining me. Please stay tuned for my Faction Overview video on the Vampire Counts and the Greenskins. I will also be doing one on the Chaos Race as best as I can with what is available through the Total Wiki page as well as the Steam page. Please leave any type of comments, feedback, suggestions, or any type of general discussion on my video comments or my Reddit link comments. But I have been Atomic Zero of Addicted to Loot. Thank you for joining me.